Um, <clears throat> dreaming, everybody's interested in dreaming, right? And from antiquity, not just recently, people have been interested in dreams and in different ways tried to understand dreams, interpret them, uh, understand them. And as some, most of you know that in the past, there are countries and dynasties and kingdoms where there are official dream interpreters for kings and royalty because it was also believed that the leaders of a country uh, dreamed for the whole country, for their subjects, for the people. So it's nothing new, even though with Freud, in the Western world, dream interpretation or dreaming became part of science, of psychology, but dreaming has been important for human society for millennia, ever since we could sleep and dream. Um, in my work as an anthropologist, I have seen most cultures uh, value dreams immensely. And it's also true that many cultures, indigenous cultures, all over the globe use dreams for healing purposes. So it's not, not really new that we do it uh, now, the last hundred years or so. And believe it or not, even with hundred years of tradition, with both Freud and post-Freudians, uh, dreams are not necessarily used in medical psychiatry for healing purposes, even now. So Jungians are somewhat exceptions that way. Um, tonight, we are very fortunate to have Roger Kamenetz, Kamenetz uh, who's, I have to admit, whose work I did not know until two days ago. And I didn't have much time to read the whole book, but I did look through it, and it's very interesting. I'm very impressed by the title itself, The History of Last Night's Dream. It has a poetic touch to it and also serious tone to it. Uh, we welcome Roger Kamenetz to tell us what he has done in his new book. And as you know, he has already written other books and award-winning author. Um, let's see, the book is called uh, Doing the Lotus. Uh, which some of you perhaps know more than I do. Um, he explored the world of dreams with the help of an unusual cast of specialists, saints, dream interpreters, whatever way you want to put them. And those of you who read the book, perhaps you have had more idea about it, but he's going to tell us about this, um, including an 87-year-old female Kabbalist in Jerusalem, a Tibetan Tulka, Tulku in Copenhagen, it's an odd combination, <laughs> and an intuitive dream master in northern Vermont. So quite a span, Jerusalem, Copenhagen, and Vermont. So obviously, Professor Kamenetz is a seeker, that's obvious to me anyway, looking for so many people in so many different places. And he's arguing that dreams are not only intensely meaningful, but also hold essential truths about who we are, about our psyche and our souls. So without more words, I will welcome Roger Kavanagh to address you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Roy. Okay, that looks good. Okay. There's a statement attributed to Philo, the Greek Jewish writer, although he probably didn't say it. Nonetheless, it's a wonderful statement. Be kind for every person you meet is fighting a great battle. And what is the battle? In my view, it's the battle of the soul struggling to find its way to God. A God whose face is hidden, as the rabbis tell us, after the destruction of the temple. And as Rabbi Nachman of Bratzlov says, it is a double hiding. Not only is God's face hidden, but in our condition, it is hidden from us that it is hidden 
so we don't even know to look. There's a struggle for the soul to emerge, for us to be who we were born to be, and that we somehow lost. And that is why so many of us dream of being lost or of losing something. And we have these dreams over and over, wandering through the streets of cities, trying to board a train in a train station where we can't find uh, where the train leaves from. The street signs change, or they're in foreign languages suddenly. What starts off as Baltimore turns to San Francisco. We have these kinds of dreams because we've lost something. Each soul struggles to become itself and emerge in the world, but there's an opposition which we experience in many ways as our drivenness, our conditioning, our lack of authenticity. This conditioning comes from the family we were born into or the people who are around us, who don't understand us, who we can't see past the surface to our true depth. And dreams display this struggle between the soul and its opposition, and yet we don't understand what we're seeing. We've lost our connection to our dreams. We've really lost them a long time ago. In my view, the great source book for dreams in the West is the book of Genesis. And it's interesting that there are 10, maybe 11 dream stories in Genesis, depending on how you do the census. And there are no dream stories in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, or Deuteronomy. The dream disappears. What happens to the dream? This is not just historical, because we ourselves experience this huge ambivalence about the dream, which I believe is also told in the book of Genesis. A friend of mine told me that his young son, who's three, had a dream where a snake uh, picked daddy up off the ground and began to swallow him. Terrifying dream. And he told his son, probably the way I would tell my child, don't be afraid, the snake isn't real, it's only a dream. And that's what we were told at some point or other, it's only a dream, it's not real. And this division between the dream and waking life that comes out of fear really runs through the whole history of the dream in the West. So that we have a tremendous fear and our response to our dreams is to interpret the fear away. So the history of interpretation and the history is underlined by fear of the dream itself. The, um, at the same time, every person, I think, while we dismiss dreams generally, and Rabbi Samuel in the third century essentially says, um, um, if I have a bad dream, I say, what do dreams matter? But if I have a good dream, he remembers a verse where it says that God will appear to us in a dream. <laughs> and I think many of us are like Rabbi Samuel, somewhat ambivalent about dreams. Oh, it's just a dream, don't worry about it. On the other hand, certain dreams we can't dismiss. And that's how I came to Really, if people ask, why did you write this book? It's because I've had certain dreams that I can't dismiss. Among those, really, I think the most important ones are dreams where the dead return to us. And I think most people, if you live a certain age, have had dreams like that. And there's such a quality to that appearance, and there's such a power to those dreams, it's very difficult to wake up from such a dream and say, oh, it's just a dream. So we've lost the dream I think because of fear. And our great source book on dreams is not Freud's interpretation of dreams, that's our second great book on dreams, but our first great book is really the book of Genesis, a book that I say should be um, read more by all the people who don't read it, and maybe a little less by some of the people who do. <laughs> but Genesis, in my view, um, encodes for us the gift of the dream and is, these gifts are gifts that we've lost and that I really was able to rediscover by the teachers um, Dr. Roy mentioned, especially to Colette Abouker Muscat, the 87-year-old Kabbalist from Jerusalem who's since passed away 
And the most important thing she taught me was that images are sovereign in the mind. And that really, all the time that we're going around in waking life, thinking in words and concepts and ideas, below the surface there's this huge fountain of images that are churning and churning and churning. It's the same fountain Coleridge discovers in Kublai Khan. There's, there's a huge fountain below the surface in the depth. And we're rarely aware of it. But Ms. Collette, Madame Collette, taught me uh, through her special method how to see these images while I was awake. And she taught me that images were sovereign in the mind. And then I needed to find a teacher of dreams. And um, I was teaching at the Vermont Studio Center, a wonderful center for artists and poets and writers in Vermont. And um, I had decided to visit this tolku that was mentioned, a reincarnated lama in Copenhagen. He was a prince's librarian, by the way, a prince of Denmark who has a Tibetan collection. I did eventually see him, very suave uh, gentleman. And um, um, I was talking to a friend, Lou Albert, an artist there, and um, he said, well, I have a dream teacher. And I said, oh, um, uh, where is he? He says, Morrisville, which is like the next town over from uh, where we were. I said, well, is he a psychologist? He said, no, he's a postman. <laughs> so I thought, wow, I really have to see him. And of course, by that time, I'd been researching the history of dreams. And eventually, in this book, I traced the history from Genesis to the rabbinic sages, to the church fathers, to Freud. I take on Freud. I bring him down. Um, and, and then I myself am brought down by my own dreams in this incredible way. I learned um, how to become a student, how to become a boy, which is very hard at my age. Um, and I'm going to explain a little bit about that in a minute. But um, I'm, I'm told I'm speaking for 20 minutes, which is probably impossible, but I'll try. Um, but you'll ask questions and I'll speak some more. So um, um, I went to see this postman, Mark Bregman, and he leads a group called North of Eden now with a group of teachers, students of his who've become teachers of the dream. And they're on northofeden.com if you want to find out more about them and their work. But um, the um, essential thing that Mark taught me was that the interpretation approach to dreams as we usually do it is wrong. And what do I mean by interpretation? I don't mean it in any soft sense. I mean when you assume that the surface of something, whether it's a text or in this case a dream, is not the meaning but that the only way to find the meeting is through a special puzzle-solving method to translate, and that the real meaning is underneath uh, in this translated uh, text or puzzle result. Of course, this is just the method that Joseph uses uh, when he translates Freud's dream of the seven cows to seven years. It's a kind of algebraic substitution. But Bregman's approach was so startlingly different. His approach really was existential in the sense that he treats the dream as real and he asks you to make choices within the dream and he holds you accountable for the choices you make in a dream, which seems like a very odd idea at first and I fought him all the way. I kept asking him to interpret my dreams and he kept insisting that he didn't want to interpret them so much as he wanted me to find the feelings in the dream, which he called the belly button. So um, I had to find the belly button. I want to explain a little bit about how that works um, and uh, then um, perhaps in questions I can explain something about the biblical dreams, but I, I'd like to at least put out there for the time uh, how this works. So, in the process of dreaming, um, I said that the soul is struggling with an opposition. And how does that work? Well, I have a client I work with, with her dreams. She sends me dreams once a week. We talk, I give her homework, and um, her psyche is in my hands. Um, <laughs> and it's been a wonderful experience, so incredible. And um, one time, after we've been working for a while, she gave me this dream. She dreamed that she was in her basement and she was chained up. She was completely wrapped in chains and she was chatting with Bob Barker. 
this is Cambridge, you probably don't know who Bob Barker is, but uh, <laughs> he's a game show host. Um, <laughs> Uh, most places I go, people know, but I, I forgot I was in Cambridge. Okay, all right, okay. So, the rest of America knows who Bob Barker is. Um, um, so, uh, don't feel you're out of touch. Um, so, she's chatting with Bob Barker, this glib game show host, and her son comes down the steps, and uh, he's on his way to high school, and she gives him a peck on the cheek and says, have a nice day. That's the dream. Now... If you assume that the dream is a puzzle with a symbol, you might start thinking, well, you know, as Freud does in certain ways, you might start thinking, gee, the chains, you know, uh, what do you free associate with chains? Did your father beat you with chains? What, you know, what's the, what's the chain story and what's the Bob Barker story? And, you know, you can go all free associate away. But if you assume that the surface meaning, the manifest dream, the actual dream is the meaning and that the search is for the feeling or the possibility of feeling, then you're going in a very different direction, aren't you? You're taking the dream seriously at its face value. And so um, the trouble this person had, and unfortunately many people have this, is she couldn't feel her feelings. Um, I had another client who dreamed that a large needle was being inserted into his knee, and he said, it was a great dream, I didn't feel a thing. I said, no, you're numb. And um, if you can't feel your pain, you can't feel other people's pain. Um, the next night he dreamed that he was in a space capsule all by himself going way beyond the moon. And um, it was the same dream, isolated, alone. He l experienced that as pleasant also. So often we're looking for the feeling or the place where there might be feeling. And so I said, you're okay chatting with Bob? She says, sure, fine, you know. You're content, yeah. I said, well, I have a question for you. Why didn't you ask your son to let you go? Why didn't you ask your son to let you go? And in discussing that, we got to how she really thought it was okay to be chained up and how she didn't think she was worthy of not being chained up and how it was very hard for her to ask anyone to help her. And so we opened up a whole lot of territory with that one dream. And that was showing, in a certain way, and don't take me, don't understand me too quickly, but in a certain way the dream was showing both the battle for her soul and the opposition to that, and in this case was represented by Bob Barker. Um, how did that work for me? Well, I had a lot of learning to do, or a lot of unlearning to do, and I'm going to close with this dream account, and then we'll see if there's some questions. But, but basically, uh, in my case, um, there were many, my opposition took the form of a certain, I guess you could call it arrogance and pride. And I began to have this dream where I'd walk into a classroom, and those of you who teach will recognize this dream, and um, I didn't know what the class it was I was teaching. And um, so I thought, I went to my head and I thought, well, I'll throw out a few ideas and um, uh, students will respond and I'll get clues like if this is algebra or poetry or what exactly I'm supposed to be teaching today. And um, um, it didn't work. The students would turn away, they wouldn't answer the question, uh, they began walking out. I kept having this dream over and over. Sometimes the classroom would expand to the size of a stadium and I would be sort of shouting and no one would pay attention. And so uh, my teacher, Mark Bregman, said to me, um, 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 how do you know you're the teacher? I said, well, Mark, I've been teaching for 26 years. Of course I'm the teacher. He says, well, did anybody in the dream say that you're the teacher? So that became my homework to see myself, and the homework is kind of a visualization, which is really what Colette was teaching me, but to see myself walking into a classroom and not be the teacher. That was so hard. It was almost impossible. Sometimes you get these homeworks and they're just so hard to do. And the struggle was all about, what do you mean, of course I'm the teacher, and all oh, my pride, my accomplishment, and everything I've ever done. I have to tell you, I once had a dream where I was on my deathbed reciting my resume. I mean, that, that's a, that, so that's, that's kind of, you know, where I was. And um, time goes by, 
And um, I have a dream. And I walk into the classroom. And the teach students are sitting around a table. And I sit down with them. And they're my fellow students. And then the teacher walks in. And it was so powerful. And you know, it was... My students say I've become a better teacher. I have to say that. that. That something about how I've taught, the way I've changed my teaching has been affected by this dream. In terms of not focusing as much on the subject matter as on creating a community where we're all learning together. But it also changed how I relate to other people because I realized this was also in a way an indicator of my approach in general to life that anyone I met was there to be my student and I was going to teach them something. And so um, this assumption, which the dream was undermining in such a beautiful way, was something that needed to be removed, an obstacle, an opposition, if my true soul, if my true being, as I'm meant to be, going to emerge. So let me say that dream work can take you on a journey and the first phase is to discover your opposition and, in a sense, to become allergic to it, not to like Bob so much that you're willing to chat with him while you're in chains. And the next phase is to encounter the soul self, which often appears as a child in a dream. And the third phase is to enter into really this entire archetypal inner world, the world of the soul and its encounter with the divine. And I find instances of these three kinds of dreams in the dreams in Genesis. Um, the dream of Abimelech, in which God tells him, you're a dead man, because he's sleeping with Sarai. That's the first kind of dream, where you see, you get warned by your dream what your predicament is. You're in chains, it's a pretty strong warning. You're a dead man is even stronger, but um, the second dream where you encounter this image of your soul is figured for me in, in Joseph's dreams when he's a boy. He has two dreams in which he sees a figure of who he's really meant to be in the world. The one is a sheaf that his sheaf stands erect and his brother's sheaves bow down. That's not who he is in the world, but that's who he's meant to be, who he's going to become 22 years later. 22 years later, he sees his brothers bowing down to him in Egypt and he remembers that dream. Joseph never interprets his own dreams. And the rabbis say he remembers them every day because a dream that's not recalled won't come to pass. And by abiding with the dream, keeping the dream in mind, it becomes, emerges as the true picture of who he's meant to be, of what his soul is. The third dream is the most obvious one. It's the dream of Jacob's ladder. And to me, this dream embodies all the promise of the dream. Jacob lies down on some rocks. He's in trouble. He's on the run. He's cheated his brother. He's betrayed his father in a way. He's fooled his father. He falls asleep on a rock. And he sees a ladder between earth and heaven. And he sees angels moving on the ladder. And he sees God. And God says to him something we all want to hear in our dreams. I am with you, and I will follow you where you go. And I believe that's the ultimate promise of the dream. Thank you. I guess it's okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I think it's the choreography. Is that right? <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. You, you sit. I'm yeah. you, okay. you mind, right? That makes it easy. Uh, thank you. Does that work? Sure. Sure. Okay. I forgot. I've been. <laughs> we haven't rehearsed, so. Um, <laughs> so um, That's all right. As long okay. as people can see me or hear me, seeing is not as important as hearing. <laughs> Stand, it'll be. Yeah. It's not for sitting. That's all right. I, I can stand.
Okay, again, thank you. Thank yeah. you for a lovely speak. How many of you have read the book? Has anybody had a chance? Oh, good. So you could refer to what um, Roger, Roger Kamenetz was saying. <laughs> and I was not sure that I should say Professor Kamenetz, Teacher Kamenetz, Jim Printer. <laughs> Some of the things you said were very interesting because we could just change the language a little bit and that's precisely what the Jungians do too, although it takes a little longer time. And the connection, the only way we put it is dreams tell us how to connect the ego with the unconscious, with the archetypal world, and then we get the message. And we also use the word living with the dream. Sometimes we say you take a dream as a shawl and put it around and keep it around. Whether you like it or not, dreams, some dreams chase you. I mean, you cannot forget them. So how that important they are, as if they want to connect to it, the conscious uh, dreamer as much as the other way around. Anyway, so would um, open the floor for questioning. Um, I thought of a question myself. I, I thought hard to find a question, but I think I'll wait a little bit and maybe at the end. So please, uh, if anybody has any questions, you can come forward because you're being recorded and uh, or any comments. I'm sure Roger would be happy to answer. Before I was sleep deprived, uh, as a mom with a young kid, I used to have really good memory of many dreams a night, you know, three or four incredibly detailed, more than you can really spend a lot of time with. And yet there are sometimes these dreams that you really, they're, they're like almost have bold around them or italics. They seem important in some way. And it's not so much that the themes are as deep as, you know, chains or, you know, but there's just something about them that they have more emphasis. And I wonder if, I haven't read the book yet, I've read a couple of your others, um, but if there was anything in your encountering where there's, you know, the differences between your day-to-day -day dreams and these emphasized dreams or whether you sort of see them as all of a piece. Yeah, I think every dream, you know, the general cultural response to dreams in our time has been either to dismiss them or to scientize them and to reduce dreams to a brain function. And I think that's really where most our culture has gone with dreams. And so it's, it's pretty surprising to have a guy come in the year 27 and talk about um, Genesis. But um, what I'm saying is I believe that rather than presume that most dreams are nonsense and meaningless, it's safer to presume that all dreams are meaningful unless proven otherwise. And I find that the most banal dreams, like the lost car in the parking lot dream, are actually the most profound and exquisite indictments of how, or warnings, of how lost we are. And in fact, in a certain way, the boring dreams, the ones we find uh, dismaying in the sense that they are so banal, are in a certain way calling on us to go further and to deepen. And that if you do this work and you feel into what are you feeling in such a dream, is this the way you feel a lot in waking life? You really begin to uncover the level at which your life is, um, is lost. So I wouldn't necessarily look for the big, bold-faced dreams to be the deepest. They may not be. The deepest dream is the dream that really asks you to change your life, at least in the beginning of this work. And they can be quite... I was quite dismayed by how not only in my first dreams when I worked with, I've been working on this stuff for about uh, seven years now. I was not only dismayed by how boring my, what me, I have boring dreams, I was very dismayed by that, but I was equally dismayed by the fact that um, my behavior in my dreams was really wretched. I was a liar, a hypocrite, um, you know. Um, I, I once um, shook the hands of President Bush even though I didn't like him at all because he was famous. Um, isn't that, I, I'm sorry to admit that again in Cambridge, but, um, <laughs> but it happened in my dream, and you know, um, these things happen. So, uh, or I, uh, you know, so I wouldn't necessarily just look for the ones that, you know, have the glowing lights and the sparkles in them to, for the deepest meanings. 
Yeah, come on. Come on down, as Bob says. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from the land of Bob Barker. Um, oh, good. Bless you, my son. <laughs> I'm, I'm a visiting emissary. Uh, it seems that you've used, and I know that used is a loaded term, but I'm going to use it anyway. I'm going to employ it anyway. It seems that dreams have become for you touchstones for healing. Uh, not asking for prescriptions, but it seems like we're living in an epidemic of bad feeling and bad karma. Any suggestions as to how people coming back from Iraq with PTSD, so on and so forth, can heal themselves through this theme of dream? Um, first of all, the dream work, you need a teacher. So the people at North of Eden um, do that work with people, and it's a one-on-one -on -one kind of process, generally. I don't think anyone should try to do this. You, you won't see your own blind spot in the dream. Like the, the woman who was in chains, even though to me or to you it might be obvious, the pain there, she didn't feel it. So you need help. In regard to the very specific syndrome that you're referring to where people have repetitive traumatic dreams, um, I, I, would, I, do, I personally don't um, know of people doing that work with, with this method. Um, I don't know whether it could or couldn't be done. But um, I know there are various other methods that are applied to, to try to help those people. Um, but. Um, I think it would be interesting to see if someone had that condition and they wanted to work with Mark Bregman or someone really experienced and see if they could work through that. I don't know. Because yeah. those dreams are very different in quality uh, from, from what we're talking about. There are psychotherapists who deal with this problem, but uh, to work with dreams of veterans, sometimes difficult because they don't want to go into the experience. But there are people who work with them. There's quite a few. If you raise your hand, just come on yeah. up. <laughs> I have a question about a connection, or a personal connection I've found between dreams and memory. Oftentimes, I'll have a dream where I'll be in, in my bedroom or a room I know well, and it feels like my memory is, is magnified in the dream, and that I'll be able to remember details like little things in the floor or the order of the posters on the wall that if you asked me right now, I'd be like, uh, well, the, I know there's some stuff over there, but I can't tell you the color or the actual detail. And so what I'm wondering is, do you think this is, do you think I actually have some extra memory in the dream? Is there, is there actually some part of my memory that I'm not able to access in waking life? Or am I just getting an impression of detail? in the dream, a sensation of that where I couldn't actually tell you the numbers that were written on the piece of paper on the table. Dreams are so remarkable as experiences and human experiences and you think that, you, I think we were dreamed into existence. I think Shakespeare had it literally right, we are such stuff as dreams are made of. I think dreams are one of the forces that have made us human beings and that to forget our dreams is to forget part of our humanity. So dreams are deeply connected to memory uh, Freud talks about hyperamnesia, which is, I think, what you're talking about, too. Rather strange, detailed memories that might show up in a dream that you couldn't possibly have remembered, and yet there they are. Um, what I'm focusing... I mean, there's so many fascinating things about dreams and creativity, dreams and poetry, dreams... You know, we could go on and on. But what I'm here to tell you about, really, is a very particular thing, which is that dreams can really be used to enter this journey of depth and self-discovery and spiritual uh, fulfillment. And therefore, while these other aspects of dreams I think are extremely interesting, they're somewhat peripheral to, to my interests as they're necessarily limited in this way. For me, the great discovery was that dreams could open me up, they could show me where I was numb, and they could help me find my soul. And I think that's plenty. They can probably also help you remember the tiles on your ceiling and other things as well, but but for me, that's not the main thing. Although I do think that the way the dreams carry specific memories of the past... I'll give an example. Um, 
Um, I, I had a dream, um, and it was very quiet. I was in bed, and um, I woke up. It was very quiet, and I walked to the window, and I looked outside, and the sidewalk and the streets were completely covered with snow. I should add that I live in New Orleans. And um, I said to myself, oh boy, no school today. <laughs> and I was immediately a boy. I was a boy. I was an eight-year-old boy at the time when in Baltimore you'd wake up and it was snowing and you knew that there was no school. And so dreams can take you with such specificity to certain kinds of feelings that you thought you've lost. And I think they do so in part to bring you back to yourself, to who you're really meant to be. And that quality of invoking memory is very powerful in dreams and convincing. But another question, yes. I'm sorry, they want you to do the mic thing. <laughs> then they can record you forever. <laughs> oh, I forgot. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I've done a, a lot of dream work, actually, with a Jungian analyst, um, and, have, and both individually and in a group, and I was struck in the group that my landscape almost consistently was, um, I would say, late afternoon that never sunny. And your, your subject makes me wonder that if I were to <clears throat> perhaps eventually find um, some more soulful place if my landscape would brighten. I don't consider myself a depressed person, but I'm struck by that. And I would, in the dream work, mm -hmm. yeah. would find some people, and the sun was shining, and flowers were growing, and they never mm -hmm. did in my dreams. So you have dream envy. <laughs> I have dream envy. Um, I, 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 I think uh, we shouldn't have dream envy. Um, each of us is given the dreams uh, that to speak to each of us and uh, in a very individual way. And the important thing is always, what, in a way, you're interpreting in a certain way. You know, that if it were a sunny landscape, that's happy. And if it were cloudy, it's not happy or whatever. But my question really was, how did you feel under that sky? What are you doing? Who are you relating to or not relating to? These are the kinds of things that I would be looking for in order to locate the belly button and find the feeling. So I wouldn't necessarily interpret the landscape as such, but more, I would really focus more on what you're feeling in that landscape and who you're talking to, who's talking to you, and what the relationship is. These are the beginnings of finding a way deeper into the dream, in my, in my view. Not so much, a, in, see, again, it's an interpretive. Instead of interpreting the dream, I would try to live it as an experience. Because you can be very happy on a cloudy day. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't see the dream as a sign about you, necessarily. Thank you. Do you have suggestions for the way to retrieve dreams if you have the perception that you just don't dream? Mm. And I'm assuming that's not accurate, that it's just a lack of awareness. Yes, and don't, don't feel bad about that. Most people tell me this, and I myself had a great deal of difficulty retrieving my dreams when I first started doing this work. I was motivated, but I, I had a great difficulty. Um, first of all, according to the science of dreaming, uh, most adults will dream three or four times a night if they have normal sleep. And there are exceptions of people, certain brain conditions, they won't dream and certain drugs they may not dream. But for most adults, you are dreaming up to three or four times a night. It does taper off a little bit as you age. Um, the um, problem, therefore, is not the question of having dreams for most people, but the question of remembering them. And um, I believe, Freud said there's a question of repression, somehow that you're purposely not remembering. Um, but I, I think it's more to do with the physiology of sleeping and waking, that when you wake, there's a shift. You know, uh, I went to a convention on dreaming, and uh, the scientist there, actually Dr. David Kahn was there, who's at Harvard Medical School, and he's, he and others were speaking about the changes in brain physiology, brain chemistry, and brain electro, electro what do you call it, electricity. Um, you know I'm out of my field right now. Um, but his comment was that we're on drugs every night that the dreaming mind is so different, brain is so different from the waking brain, it's like being on drugs. So there is a loss. 
when we wake. And I found that if you write the dream down right after, before you let NPR come on or do anything else, then you're much more likely over time to recover your dreams. The other thing is, if you value your dreams, if someone else values, you, values your dreams, you're more likely to remember them. So my lay advice is tell your dreams to someone who loves you. Um, that's very important to tell your dreams to someone who loves you. And um, if, um, if you write them down um, over time and you cherish them, value them, you'll remember more and more of them. But it's a learning process, learning to remember, essentially. Um. Oh, you have a question. Okay. I could ask several questions, but I'll start with one. Okay. You said that you demolished Freud. Would you talk about that in a little more detail? Yes. <laughs> I, uh, I took Freud on on the grounds of his own dreams. And um, in the chapter, uh, I start with the dream, the most important dream in the interpretation of dreams, which is the dream of Irma, who was a patient of his. And he himself was so excited by his interpretation of this dream that he envisioned a plaque being put on the house outside where he had this dream. That here, Dr. Sigmund Freud uh, discovered the secret of dreams. The secret of dreams was revealed here on July 24th, 1895. Um, I visited Freud's home in Vienna with my daughter, my wife. And my wife, we had a little plaque and they had a little picture of um, this plaque, which eventually was put on the home. And um, my daughter pointed out to me that it was July 24th, 2005. <laughs> so I thought, wow, uh, okay. So whatever that means. But um, Freud's dreams, um, Freud is so important to us. First of all, the most important thing about Freud, in my view, is that he spent five years plunging into his dreams, taking them seriously, trying to come to terms with them. And Freud had no Freud. He had no one to help him. So Freud, although he likened himself to Joseph, Freud believed that he could interpret his own dreams. And that method of interpretation that he discovered takes him to a series of intellectual puzzles. And he also used a method of free association, which even takes him further from the manifest dream. Because if you free associate, if you have Let's say you have chains in the dream, and then you start free associating chains, brains, you know, it doesn't work quite that way, but you get the, you know, drains, whatever. You free associate away. I'm a poet, so I'm doing rhymes. But you free associate, um, and then that material is somehow supposed to be relevant. And by the time he's finished um, doing all that, it's, it's quite a fascinating detective story, Sherlock Holmesian kind of effect. And it's always a profound answer, but it's always the same answer. Um, that Freud comes up with, interestingly, in certain ways, that dreams have to do with our drives, and particularly our sexual drives. Um, so it's odd that this, he uses very acrobatic interpretive methods, but always comes to the same answer. That's a little suspicious. Um, in the dream of Irma, um, what happens? A Freud um, is approached by a woman, a young woman named Irma, who says, um, um, I can't speak, I'm choking, I'm in pain. Now, if, that, if a woman came up to you in real life, and that's the way Mark Bregman thinks about this, and said, I'm choking, I'm in so much pain, what would you do? Where would you go? In the dream, Freud takes her aside and tries to force open her throat. And it's quite ticked at her for not opening her throat wider. To me, that's very strange behavior. It only makes sense if he's assuming that he has to be Dr. Freud in his dream. He doesn't have to be Dr. Freud. He makes a choice to be the doctor. He does that in most of his dreams. But he doesn't have to be. He could be a boy. He could be a student. He could be different. And he could feel more. And so he misses the opportunity to feel in that dream and in most of his dreams. And instead, he almost always goes for uh, the answer. Um, and uh, there's another dream of Freud's that I talk about in the book where um, he's, um, he's kind of becoming a boy because he's running up the stairs and taking his clothes off. 
uh, and um, a, an old woman who's a maid steps out from the shadows and freezes him in his tracks. And Freud talks about everything, um, spitting, his possible fear of having cancer and heart attack. and His analysis really goes far afield. But he never deals with the fact that there's this opposition within him who takes the form, in this case, of an older woman that can freeze him in his tracks and inhibit him from being this joyful boy bounding up the stairs. And so he takes the dream into other territory. So basically what I do with Freud is try to show what he's really feeling or seems to be feeling or ought to be feeling in his dreams and how he's unable to come to his feelings. So, But you can read the... As a, authors always say, read the book, but the, I, I, try, I do it in quite a bit of detail, so I feel I do take them take on. And it was a big deal to me to take on Father Freud. Um, it was huge. Hey. I'm intrigued by your uh, notion of uh, the belly button, or finding the belly button, which sounds like uh, an attempt to find something that's uniquely personal about your dream, but <clears throat> in another sense, it seems like a kind of preoccupation with one's self. And I'm wondering how you might quantify the, the social utility of dream work. I mean, what impact does it have on groups of people? Does it make us somehow more tolerant or uh, wiser or more compassionate to go through dream work? Naturally. Um, <laughs> but, but I would say that um, the belly button, as Mark Bregman describes, and it's really his term, Freud also speaks to the belly button and means something entirely different, but in Bregman's sense, the belly button is the point of feeling, of actual feeling or the possibility of feeling in the dream. Um, it's not about the ego. People confuse ego, self, soul, they're all kind of mishmash together, but it's not so much about the ego as it is about rediscovering the boy, the girl, the soul self, and that takes a tremendous amount of unpeeling and unlearning. Um, what is the social utility? It's a great question. Um, I feel that if people begin to realize how, how they're loved in their dreams, essentially, and how valuable each of us is, uh, value ourselves, value what goes on inside us, we become more sensitive, we become more feeling, we become more compassionate and able to understand the feelings of others. I think that's a good thing. Yes, sir. And there's another fellow behind you. But... Uh, I've, I've heard that, um, or read about uh, Jung as being more of, uh, focusing more on dreams than and Freud basically surpassing Freud in terms of the um, intellectual understanding and perhaps either or both of you could address um, um, Jung versus Freud and and how that can uh, affect the, the belly button right uh, the feelings right um, I think that the work the work that Mark Bregman does um, is definitely Jungian based and he talks about the archetypes and he talks, but, but the way that Mark has been doing this work for 35 years and through long experience, the way he works these archetypes and the way he works the dreams is really different. And he sees them in a different configuration from Jung. It would, it would be, it'd be hard to explain in, in, the, in this format, but I do try to explain it in the book, the difference. The main thing I think, in my view, what Mark Bregman does is he goes back to the original adventure of Freud's own several year plunge into the world of his active fantasy. Uh, Jung had a capacity apparently to visualize on his own and, and sort of go into his dream world while awake. And that's where he made many of these initial discoveries of the archetypes. However, later he, he kind of felt that that unreserved plunge into the dream might be too dangerous for some people. And he uh, only late in his last work, uh, which is called The Mystery of the Conjunction in English, it's called Mysterium Conjunctionis, but it's really The Mystery of the Conjunction. Um, he discusses this process again. He goes back to this original process in which the dreams are lived seriously um, 
uh, and instead of uh, being seen as aesthetic objects or being seen as a, a remove of interpretation. Um, so I, I don't, I mean, it's, uh, I, I think we could get into that in a great deal of detail, but, but the, basically I would say that Bregman's work is Jungian based, but it's, he's not a Jungian as such. And if I could see a difference, my own, and I don't know because I've never done Jungian therapy myself, but the feeling I have is that Bregman's work is more almost direct. He's almost like a shaman. I mean, he has this feel for it. And he's also incredibly brave. And uh, he's not afraid to lose clients uh, at all. And um, so there's a kind of interesting, you know, he really delivers the message of the dream. And I think by doing that in an unreserved way, uh, those who can handle that are really appreciate that. And I'm not deprecating. I don't have enough data here about what Jungians do, but Dr. Roy does, so maybe she'll well, say I something. I could just add a few words, maybe. Uh, Freud and Jung traveled together to this country, uh, being invited by Clark University, perhaps you know. And on the way, they were talking, discussing each other's dreams. They were interpreting each other's dreams. And that's the first time Freud, Jung was very much Freud's uh, protege, son, very much, very involved. First time they met, they talked for eight hours nonstop. So that was kind of intimacy. But then when they were discussing their dreams, the first difference started then. Jung, there was a dream about going to the bottom of the house, the basement. And Jung said, I think it also refers to bigger picture, archetypal picture. And Freud rejected that. He said it was just personal. So that was the beginning of the difference. And that's where the basic theoretical difference also comes in. But one more comment I want to make. When you work with dreams with people, each therapist, interpreter, teacher, if it's a good one, has to deal with that individual, the individual need, and they figure out what is the belly button or the pivotal problem. And so each interpretation in each work with each person slightly different. And because when Jung was now talking about being dangerous, if you have a person who has latent psychosis and you immediately go into the unconscious, it can be dangerous. And for, I've been practicing 30 years and I can tell you this is true. So you have to go cautiously, but you also, also cater to the individual need and what they're dealing with for. But the fact remains working with dream, just paying attention to the dreams can be very healing, no question about it. Thank you so much. Um, I wonder if it's possible that anything in the dream content comes from outside of the person. Do you believe that? And I've had some dreams that indicated that something else was happening. It wasn't just my psyche at work. Okay. Um, yeah, this whole question of where the dreams come from, where the archetypes come from, is it only inside? Is it something outside of us? What? It's so fascinating. It's so interesting. And when I first started doing this work and I began having these kinds of experiences, and even just in the beginning, the wonder of having dreams that were so much smarter than I was, where people were saying things that were so much more brilliant, or where I was seeing beautiful, beautiful images that I could never have created in my entire life, um, you begin to wonder you know, the capacity that we have. And then when you start actually having people who appear as teachers, um, even if you don't always get the lesson. Um, you know, I, I had a dream where um, I was in a poetry class and the teacher was a naked woman. And one of the students was complaining that she didn't talk about poetry enough. <laughs> <laughs> Probably went to Harvard, I don't know, but um, I said, I'm a Yale person. So I said, um, you know, um, gee, um, what more? could the teacher do for you than what she was doing already to teach you that the naked heart is, is at the root of what poetry is about. So, w I don't know the answer. I, d I don't know the answer to the question, but I just know you're absolutely right that dreams have this uncanny quality that makes us feel they're coming from outside of us or beyond us or from so deep within us that it's just astonishing. Uh, when I was younger, my mom, uh, I told my dreams to my mom, and my mom would always tell me 
that I wasn't responsible for anything that I did in my dream. If I stole something or broke something, that it wasn't my fault, you know. <laughs> and uh, I guess nice. this <laughs> makes you look at it in a different way. But, um, but I wonder whether there's a difference between dreams in which uh, you are sort of very active, making decisions, and dreams in which uh, the primary content of the dream is things that happen to you. I, when you spoke about the dream of Jacob's Ladder, that seemed like a dream of uh, almost of observation. That it was sort of a, a vision of things, of things occurring, but there was sort of little interaction between the person who was having the dream and the objects in terms of on, in, on a physical level. Uh, and there are other lots of stories about dreams of people who uh, who dream works of art that they later create. And I wanted to know what you uh, thought about that difference. Well, I think, that, I think it's good to observe whether you're active or passive in your dreams and whether you're paralyzed, unable to speak, unable to ask for help. Um, I think these are important things to look at in terms of trying to discover the feelings in a dream. Um, you know, Jacob's dream always impresses me. First of all, it's the last, it, it's not interpreted. No one interprets the dream. Rather, Jacob wakes and his world's transformed and he says, how awesome is this place? And um, I think that that's a paradigm for me to what this is all about, that the experience in dreams is not only real, usually we think, you know, dream versus reality, but in Jacob's case, the dream is not only real to him, and the promise that's made to him in the dream is real, that I will be with you. The experience is seen by him as real, but in fact it's seen as more real a transforming kind of real that changes the world when he wakes. And so that suggests that the equation of real, you know, unreal and dream may not be a true equation, that, that dreams have the capacity to change our consciousness and therefore change our world. And I think that's to me what Jacob's dream represents and some of the creative dreams you're talking about. Robert Louis Stevenson called dreams the cobbler's elves because he would go to sleep and dream and wake up with a story like Dr. Jekyll came out of a dream. So for some creative artists, dreams are um, a great way to get their work started. Um, so I don't know what the timing is. Are we still, we have more time? Or? You, 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 you had a question, I think. No, oh, it's all right. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess when there are no questions, time is right. Are there any more questions? I didn't want to cut it short, but... I'd... Well, I do have a question, maybe I'll... Okay, all right, we'll end with um, your question. You are from literature, right? Your original field. And what brought you, what made you so curious about dreams? So is it a personal experience, or if you don't have to talk about it, if it's too personal, but was there a particular event that made you so intent to find out and to learn about it? Well, well, the short answer is I've had the dreams I mentioned. Um, I had dreams um, really earliest in my earliest work in poetry. Uh, dreams where uh, my grandfather appeared after his death and seemed to be encouraging. And then my mother died at a very young age, and uh, I wrote an entire book based on a dream I had of her, and that was quite a long time ago, called Terra Inferma. But um, the the nearer term curiosity had to do with the fact that. Um, when I did the book, The Jew and the Lotus, when we met the Tibetans, um, I saw that how powerful dreams and visualizations and images were in their religious tradition. And I began to be curious, well, what happened to the dream in the West? What happens to the dream in the, among the biblical people, among Jews and Christians? Because it's pretty clear we have this great book, Genesis, um, about dreams, and yet if you look at contemporary religious practice, there's nothing going on about dreams. So what happened to the dream? Um, and um, I think that that was my curiosity in part. Why did the revelation dream disappear? So I hope we brought it back tonight. And uh, thank you. Thank you.